we are constantly finding ourselves in situations where we need help. Whether it's in our job, whether it's in relationships, health, car breakdowns, it never ends. We are needy people. I'd say we are pathetic people, but I wouldn't want to offend. We are, we are needy people. But in our individualistic culture, we fool ourselves into a, a, a self-sufficient independence and try our absolute best to save ourselves. And if we cannot deliver ourselves, well, prayer becomes like a last resort, right? And when God answers us, we often fail to give him the due thanks. Or even worse, we fail to recognize that it was God's goodness at all. Bless you. So let me ask you some questions. How often do you realize that like a branch is to the vine, you are totally dependent on God? And when faced with trials, how long or how hard does it need to get for you to cry out to the one who is sovereignly in control? And when you are delivered, how often do you give thanks for God's goodness? Well, today's psalm, Psalms 107, will address these areas today. And I guess the question is, where does the psalm fit? What, what is the context? Well, the Psalm 107, as you may have seen in your Bibles, begins the fifth and final book of the entire collection of Psalms. Book five is focused on obedience and true worship of God in the absence of a physical king. Psalms 107, it actually forms a trilogy with Psalms 105 and 106, all three of them beginning with praise and thanks to God for His goodness. It's an invitation to give thanks. And the context and time of the psalm, it's indicated to be after Israel had returned after the Babylonian exile. So get that in our heads. It is after the exile. God has delivered them. If we look at verse 2 and verse 3, they talk about the redeemed of the Lord. The redeemed of the Lord, those who had been gathered from every direction. And if we look back one chapter, we see that the deliverance that is described throughout 107 is actually the answer to prayer. Look back one chapter, Psalm 106, verse 47 says, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the Gentiles. Gather us from among the Gentiles. This is why. Psalms 107 is deliberately placed at the beginning of book 5. God had most certainly gathered them, saved the nation of Israel from the hand of their enemies. Egypt to the south, Assyria to the north, the Philistines to the west, and Babylon to the east. So this is the context. Israel had returned from the Babylonian exile. And we... As Christians, we are also the redeemed of the Lord. Amen? So this, this invitation to praise God for His goodness is just as fitting and just as valid for us as it was to the nation of Israel. So what are the themes? What are we going to be pulling out today? Well, Psalms 107, it is a beautifully composed song. Those 43 verses, it's, it's a song, much like the songs we sing today. It has an introduction it has four verses, each with a recurring chorus, a bridge, and then an outro. And in a nutshell, it encourages its readers to give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and steadfast love. That's its aim, to give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and His steadfast love. God's goodness, God's goodness, it is the main theme today. And we will be looking at uh, three ideas to develop this theme of God's goodness. What are those ideas? Well, the first idea is we're going to be looking at our dependence, our dependence on God's goodness. After that, we'll look at the idea of <coughs> the power and the principle of God's goodness. And finally, we'll look at our thanksgiving for 
God's goodness. Those are the three ideas we'll be looking at, and it will be different from our usual verse by verse. Like I warned you at the beginning, have your Bibles open. We're going to be jumping around a bit, and I hope you'll keep up. So let's look at our first idea. Our dependence on God's goodness. Throughout Psalms 107, God's goodness and good works are constantly referred to. But what is meant by God's goodness? We, we say that a lot. It can be a big lofty term. What, what is meant by God's goodness? Well, according to Wayne Grudem, he defines it like this. The final standard, God's goodness, is the final standard of all good and all he is and does is worthy of approval. God's goodness is the final standard of all good and all he is and does is worthy of approval. That is God's goodness. He's not just kind of good. He's not just good enough. No, he is the final and the ultimate standard of all that is good. It's intrinsic. It's part of who he is. It's his nature, and it's part of his works as well, which is why in Psalms 119, verse 68, it says, you are good, and you do good. You see the two there? You are good, and you do good. Examples of his goodness are mercy, grace, long-suffering. These flow out of his goodness. And if you look at the end of verse 1 of our psalm today, it says that his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. The word endures actually isn't there in the original language. It's put there to read better, but it's actually his mercy forever. How neat does that sound? His mercy. It's, It's actually a translation of the Hebrew word chesed, which is the everlasting, steadfast love, that covenantal love which he demonstrates to Israel again and again, and he demonstrates to us. That is what mercy is talking about here, the steadfast love. This is also intrinsic to his nature, and it should be noted that all creation, everything in it, benefits from and depends on these characteristics. Have you reflected on James 1.17 before? which says every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. It comes from above. Meaning anything that has a shred of goodness is from God. The breath in our lungs, the enjoyment of food, the rain, the sunlight that grows crops. If it is good, where is it from? It's from God. All of mankind, the wicked and the unrighteous, they depend on God's goodness, whether they know it or not. And as mentioned earlier, we constantly find ourselves in situations where we need God out of his goodness and mercy to save us. Constantly we find ourselves. And the psalmist illustrates four examples of how the people of Israel experience this. These are not allegories. These are real examples that he's reflecting on of how God saved the people of Israel. If you look at verse 4 and 5, what we see there is the lost soul. Verse 4 and 5, the psalmist describes the, the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness, homeless, hungry, and thirsty. They were so exhausted that, what does it say there, their souls had fainted in them. This pr- picture brings to mind Israel wandering in the desert for 40 years. In the desert, it has a very harsh and unforgiving climate. If you do not have the correct clothing, the collect correct supplies and shelter, you most certainly will die from heat stroke, hypothermia, or something venomous. Take your pick. These lost souls were in need of a guide to direct them to a place of refuge. This is the first illustration, the lost soul wandering. And perhaps... You have felt this way before too. Wandering with no purpose in life or feeling like you're in a spiritual wasteland as you grapple and struggle with your faith during a a tough trial or after you leave home for the first time, you go to uni. It can be a, a lonely, lonely time. We too can be lost and wandering. 
The second illustration, jump down to verse 10 and 12, the psalmist describes the captive soul. The captive soul. He paints a vivid picture of Israel, God's chosen people who had conquered the land, land of Canaan, who lived under the powerful kingdom of Solomon, sitting in darkness. Here they are, bound in affliction and chains. Verse 12, they were forced into slave labor and worked to the point of utter exhaustion. And what's obvious is that the affliction described here, it's a form of God's discipline. It's a form of God's discipline, which we'll look at later. Verse 12, it starts, therefore, verse 11, because they rebelled against God and his word, therefore, God's discipline comes down on them. But we know from Scripture that Israel was taken captive by Assyria and Babylon because they had consistently rebelled against God. God's word, it should not be trifled with. It should not be disregarded because it gives life and it protects us. So to go against it is asking for trouble. It's asking for bondage. It can be self-inflicted. These captive souls that we read of, they were in need of a liberator to set them free. Now, you may have never been imprisoned or chained before, but I'm sure you've felt like that before. Whether it's a, a stressful job, a toxic relationship, or financial crisis, we too can be captive to many things. Well, let's look at the third illustration. Third illustration, verse 17 and 18. We read of the sick soul. And once again, God brings affliction because of blatant disobedience. God brings down the affliction. Verse 17 18, because of their transgression, because of their iniquities, they were afflicted. They were fools, transgressing against God and refused to face the reality that God knew better. He afflicted them with a sickness to the point where they couldn't even think about food, and they were at the gates of death itself. Sometimes sickness can be self-inflicted. We can think of the drug addict or the alcoholic. But sometimes, out of discipline, God can afflict his people with sickness. That's what we're reading here. A perfect example of this is Numbers chapter 21, where God brought down mass sickness upon Israel, with bites of serpents because of their what? Their grumbling. Constantly grumbling, and God brings down these serpents. And something similar is happening right here in this example. These sick souls were in need of a healer to heal them. Some of you know what I'm talking about here. Where you don't even want to look at food and you feel like you are on your deathbed. I felt like that when I was in Myanmar after water poisoning. It's horrible. All of us can relate to having an illness, a disease, or an injury. We too are often sick and in need of the great physician. And the final illustration, final illustration we'll see in verse 23. Starting in verse 23, uh, it describes businessmen who are out at sea that experienced many storms, and they quickly realize the human limitations against the forces of nature. The psalmist goes through great lengths. This is the longest verse of them all. Goes through great lengths to describe these helpless sailors who were all at the mercy of God. Now, verse 26, it sounds like a roller coaster. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their souls melt because of trouble. Talk about dramatic. Verse 27, they reel to and fro and stagger like drunken men and are at their wits ends. They're at their wit's end. That, that literally means their wisdom is swallowed up. All of their sailing knowledge, all the experience they've had in the past was useless in this moment. They were terrified souls in need of deliverance from the stormy ocean. Maybe you've done a bit of sailing yourself. You can relate to this picture. But for those who haven't, 
in a figurative sense, we can feel like we're tossed about in the storms of life, right? George Horn once said, we cannot help reflecting that there is a ship in which we are all embarked. There is a troubled sea in which we all sail, and there are storms by which we are all frequently overtaken. We too are often at our wit's end. Our wisdom cannot save us. We become terrified of the unknown and the chaos, and we are in need of deliverance. Each of these four examples, they, they demonstrate something. They demonstrate how often we need saving. We look at Israel and say, wow, they needed saving a lot. It reflects us as well. And the good thing that affliction does is reveal what was always true. And what's that? That we are utterly, and I mean utterly, dependent on God's goodness and mercy. And hopefully, when you are in trials, it leads us to what it led these men to, and that is prayer. Cast your eyes on verse 6, 13, 19, 28. They all say the same thing. Verse 6, 13, 19, and 28. They were at their wit's end. They were in trouble. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. In each of the real-life examples, it seems like they waited until like they were utterly helpless before crying out. And that's what we're often guilty of. And it's been rightly said that it's human nature that as long as there is someone who can help below, we will not look above. Oh, how we grit our teeth and we try to solve it ourselves. Oh, we'll go, I'll go to that guy and get help. And oh, I'll think of this another idea and I'll try that. I'll see this doctor. I'll get we spend five days trying to solve something before spending five seconds asking God for help. Suffering, it, it has a way of tenderizing even the most stubborn heart that is self-dependent. John Calvin once said, when we are enjoying peace and quietness, our dependence on God too easily evaporates. When things are going well, our dependence on God easily evaporates and trials can bring us back to that, that realization that we are dependent. But nonetheless, these men in these examples, they realize that no one could save them but God himself. And out of desperation, out of humility, out of repentance, with repentant hearts, they prayed to God for help. And note, their prayer may have been weak, it may have been feeble, it might have been a, a scream, but it was to the right person. That's what's important. It was to the right person. So let me ask you, do you remember? Do you realize? Do you live dependent on God? Do you realize how little control you have in life? Or is God your last resort when you can't solve your problems? I have a personal story uh, that reminded me just how little control I have and how dependent I am on God's goodness. About two weeks ago, my wife and I were driving uh, to Darfield to have dinner with the wonderful Winslades. And um, as we hit the highway coming out of town, our car starts jerking violently. And uh, suddenly, the engine shuts off in fifth gear. Okay, we're on the highway. We are on the outside lane. It's rush hour traffic. The left lane has an on-ramp. It was a mess. So we have to pull up to the right as best as we can and try and gather our thoughts. But in that moment, we were helpless, plans were interrupted, and we were in need of saving. There we were on the highway, had our plans, car shut off. And the truth is, in our own strength without God, we, we are helpless in this way. We're sometimes in fifth gear, but we have... No power in the engine because we keep trying and trying to solve it ourselves without God. But don't just think about the big dramatic situations, okay? Car breakdown. Oh, we need, I need God to, to help out. And it's not just the big situations. You need his help just as much as you have small problems. 
how to respond to that snarky comment from your colleague or your family member. Or the self-discipline to read the Bible consistently. We need God in the big and small things. So how often do you forget that you are always and utterly dependent on God's goodness? Let's move into our second idea. Second idea, which is the power and principle of God's goodness. You're doing well. I'm seeing some very red faces. <laughs> it's very warm. In every single example, in every single example, God, what does he do? They cry out, and God steps in, and he delivers his people from their affliction. You'll see in verse 6, 13, 19, and 28, straight after they cry out to help, he delivered them out of their distress. He delivered them out of their distress. There is no delay indicated. He swoops in and he saves them. Now, of course, that's not always the case in life, but the psalmist shows that God is able to save his people in an instant. That's the God we serve. And that's the first thing to note. What we see here is that God's goodness, which is totally undeserved by anyone and everyone, it is powerful. It is powerful. God is completely sovereign over everything. Have a look at verse 7. We'll just go through each of the illustrations. How does he swoop in and save them in an instant? Verse 7. He leads the lost soul in the wilderness to a place of refuge. Verse 9. He, he satisfies them then. He satisfies the hungry soul with goodness. He saves them and then satisfies their whole being. In verse 14, the next illustration, next example, God is able to bring and free the captive soul out of darkness and break their chains to pieces. No chain, no prison, no kingdom can withstand God's power. What about the sick soul? Let's look at verse 20. From verse 20, he is able to heal the sick soul with what? The power of his word. Just his word. From the beginning of time, Scripture testifies just how powerful his word is. He spoke and the universe was created. He sends his word and they are healed. What about verse 29? What about our friends on the stormy oceans? Verse 29, it shows that God has power over creation itself. The storm is raging. They are reeling to and fro like drunk men. And then in an instant, he calms the ocean and subsequently calms their souls. It goes from chaos to calmness. Reminds us of a sim uh, another story, doesn't it? Hold that thought. We can see from these vivid illustrations that God can deliver his people in powerful ways. It isn't, it isn't always an extension of his goodness. It is, sorry, always an extension of his goodness, mercy, and grace. Now, I want to point to the fact that the psalmist, the psalmist wants to show the reader just how God's goodness operates sometimes. He demonstrates a, a principle of God's goodness. We've seen how powerful he is. He, then, he wants to show a principle of God's goodness. And that principle is this. Out of God's goodness and in his sovereignty, he can afflict his people in order to bring about repentance and restoration. I'll give you time to write that down. Out of God's goodness and in his sovereignty, he can afflict his people in order to bring about repentance and restoration. Now, we saw in verse 11 the case of those captive in chains, and in verse 17, those sick on their deathbed. Why was that? 
was because God had brought the affliction on them and because they had rebelled against him and his word. So we look at that and we can, we can ask the question, were those unloving or were those bad things to do? Well, they were unpleasant, definitely, but they were not bad. They were not bad. It's obvious that they needed their rebellious, their self-dependent uh, hearts broken down. And we read of this. We see this uh, in the New Testament. We read this in Hebrews 12, how God disciplines those he loves. For a moment, it's unpleasant, but it brings about righteousness and goodness. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Our Father disciplines us. And Israel was disciplined. It needed to be taken captive by Babylon in order to turn their hearts and their allegiance back to God. God brings trials for our ultimate good. And on this topic, uh, Charles Spurgeon once said, It is a blessed thing when the waves of affliction wash us up upon the rock of confidence in God alone. When darkness below gives an eye to the light above. The waves of affliction wash us on God, our rock. And of course, th this idea, it reminds us of Romans 8.28. We're all very familiar with it, which says that all things work together for good to those who love him. Why does he do that? Or how does he do that? Verse 29, by conforming us to the image of his son. And that conforming, that's transformation, it, it takes a few trials to round off our rough edges. God's goodness does not always operate in the way that we'd expect. Now we are going to turn our attention to the bridge of the psalm, verses 33 to 42. Verses 33 to 42, that chunk there, we see a contrast. A contrast between God's blessing in response to man's obedience and God's judgment on man's disobedience. In the context of the psalm, who are to Israel, to God's people, we see this principle of his goodness working out. We see from verse 33 and, and 34, prosperity being turned to poverty. God can turn a river into a wilderness. He can turn a, a water spring into dry ground and a fruitful land into something barren because of the direct result of wickedness. We see from verse 35 to 38, he can turn barrenness into blessedness. He is powerful. He can do anything. He turns a wasteland into an oasis for the upright. Those who used to hunger, they now have an abundance to prosper and multiply. And then we see straight away the psalmist alternates back to those who need discipline, who are sinning. From verse 39 to 40, it shows oppressors who are on the top falling to the bottom. It says God pours contempt on princes who afflict the lowly and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Go back to the beginning of our psalm. The wandering in the wilderness. That wandering, it led to godly dependence when they realized they were in need of God. His judgment can and often does bring people to their knees and soften their hearts to repent in humility. Think of Paul's conversion. Think of our friend Jonah, who had to be turned back with a storm and a whale. And finally, in verse 41, we see the lowly brought high. Yet he sets the poor on high far from affliction. From this bridge, from this paragraph, we can see that God can restore or revert nature, health, wealth, and social status out of his goodness to bless obedience or restore disobedience. 
King Nebuchadnezzar. He's a perfect example of this. In Daniel chapter 4, we read about him boasting about his kingdom. He's walking around, he's boasting about his amazing kingdom, and God afflicts him for his pride and his godlessness. We know the story. He turns him into a beast of the field. Within, within one hour, he goes from being a king to being a beast in the field, driven out like an animal. But the story, it doesn't end that way. That's what's really neat. After seven years, he, he humbles himself. King Nebuchadnezzar, he humbles himself and God, before God, and his kingdom is restored. Just like that, God can turn. God can change anything. He's sovereign and he's powerful. If I've lost you, I apologize, but please just remember this. God is powerful enough to deliver anyone who cries out to him, and out of his goodness and sovereignty, he can bring about affliction to bring his people back to repentance. Now, do not mishear me. I'm not saying all trials are a result of God's discipline, but it is helpful to be reminded that his goodness can look very different to our definition. Perhaps you've been wondering what happened to our emergency on the highway, in our car. Well, God delivered us in a miraculous way. In a miraculous way. I'm not making this up so I can have a cool illustration. We managed to get the car started again, and we, we putted over safely to the left-hand side and Lo and behold, our good friends, Joshua and Casey, drive right behind us. Perfect timing. They see us, they pull over, and we start talking to them, and we thank them. You guys are, you guys are godsends, and, and oh, man, what are we going to do? We're not sure. We're, we're going to Darfield, and we're having dinner. Looks like we'll have to cancel plans. Where are you guys going? They're going to West Melton to look at buying a car, which is 10, 15 minutes away from Darfield. And it was just incredible. I don't know about you, but it, it has God's goodness all over it. The, the timing, the placement, the schedules could only have been orchestrated by God. And I caught myself saying, wow, what are the chances? You know, we say that, wow, what are the chances? Well, duh, it's 100. The chances are 100. When you have a sovereign God, there's no such thing as luck. There's no such thing as good luck or bad luck in every situation. In fact, the word luck should not be in your vocabulary unless pot is in the front of it. So that is our story. God delivered us in an amazing way. So do you remember? Do you remember God's sovereignty in all situations and that he has the power to deliver you? And do you remember that sometimes in his goodness, he brings about trials to bring our hearts back to himself. Well, let's move on then to our, our third and final idea, building on to this God's goodness, this theme, and that is our thanksgiving for God's goodness. We're on the home stretch now. The Christian's life, it should be marked with the habit of thanksgiving. We should be known for that. Scripture, it constantly invites people to, to praise God, to give thanks, and in Psalms 107, it's, it's probably one of the strongest invitations we have. It asks it and says it over and over again. So right now, I want to look at the, uh, the why, the what, and the how of thanksgiving. The why, the what, and the how of thanksgiving. Why do we give thanks? What's the reason why? Well, two reasons. It's a duty, and it is also a remedy. A duty and a remedy. The psalm begins with, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. The Holy Spirit, through the psalmist, is emphatic that we are to give thanks. Oh, give thanks. We often do not. You may have heard the story of the man who is rushing late to catch a flight and he's late to the airport and he's driving around the car park over and over and he, and he says, God, please find me a car park. I really need this. I'll read my Bible more. I'll go to church more. And miraculously, 
a man runs out, gets into the car and drives off. And he says, never mind, Lord, I found one. We should not be guilty of this. When we pray, when we have prayers answered, we need to give thanks. It is the, it is the least we can give, and it is all we can give to an all-sufficient God. It's a duty. It is a duty that brings God glory, and we are to give thanks simply because it's commanded of us. It is commanded of us, regardless of how we are feeling. What's our favorite verse for prayer? Philippians 4, 6, right? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And it says to, to give our prayer, supplication, with what? With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Colossians 3, 15 to 17. I was reading it recently. See how many times you can spot the command to give thanks. Colossians 3, 15 to 17. Be thankful with thankfulness in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Three times within three verses. It is a duty because it's commanded of us. And not only is it a duty, but it's actually a remedy for us. It's a remedy. How is it a remedy? Well, Israel recorded many of God's works, just like we're reading in Psalms. They learned them in songs so that they would not forget and then grumble against God like their forefathers did. They became historians of God's goodness. I heard that the other day. Lord, please make me a historian of your goodness. We should be historians too. A heart of thankfulness, it acts as a remedy and protects us against the disses. What are the disses? Well, the discontentment protects us against discouragement and disbelief. It is very hard to be genuinely thankful and giving thanks as well as being discouraged, discontent, having disbelief. So the question is, how well are you fulfilling your duty of thankfulness? Well, if you're feeling discontent or discouraged, that's a pretty good indicator. And the thing is, even if our emotions say otherwise, we must adopt a heart of thanksgiving. So that is the why. It's a duty, and it's a remedy for us. Let's look at the what. What should be in our thanksgiving? Well, two things. God's character and God's works. God's character and works. The chorus, the chorus that is repeated four times throughout the Psalms in each of the illustrations when they are delivered, verse 8, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. We are to give thanks for who he is and not just what he does. Often we say something like, thank you for my car, Lord, thank you for my job, thank you for my family, amen. And that's great. But how much time do we thank him for his character, for his love, his righteousness, his holiness, his beauty? Those things are alone worthy to be thanked. So next time you pray, take note what you give thanks for. Get in the habit of thanking God for both his works and his character, because the Bible does it all the time. And lastly, let's look at the how. We've seen the why. We've seen what it should contain. How should we be giving thanks? We have an indication in our Psalms. Two, two things, verbal and public. Verbal and public. What does verse 2 say? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It doesn't say, let them think so or feel so. No, we should let others hear it as well. We can be thankful in our hearts, but it, it says, say so. Look down to verse 22. Verse 22 says, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Declare his works with rejoicing. And that's what we'll be doing very soon with our song, what we've done this morning. Verse 32, jump down 10 more verses. 
let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. What we're seeing here is that there's a verbal and a public nature with thanksgiving. And that's why a lot of the Christian life, it's lived in congregational worship. Being thankful, I talked about before, it's a remedy to our own hearts, but when it's verbalized and when it's public, well, it's actually bringing God glory as others witness who He is and what He's done in our lives. They too can benefit for what we are, we've been de- delivered from, what we're thankful for. They can be reminded of God's goodness. So why do we do it? We've seen what it should contain and how. So then how should I respond with my recent uh, deliverance on the highway? I should give thanks. Obviously, I should give thanks. I should give God the praise because it's due to Him. He didn't need to do that. Otherwise, I might forget quickly of the miracle that it was and then quickly grumble about this car that keeps breaking down and all the things we have to fix in it. And I should give thanks not just for getting out of that situation, but specifically for God's mercy, for His love, for His goodness on that day. And I should give thanks not just privately in my heart, but verbally and publicly to others to glorify God and encourage them as well. So do you remember to give thanks? Is it a natural habit in your life? Because it should be. If it's not, read through Psalms 107. Read it out loud. Make it something very natural to you. Is your thanksgiving a holistic praise? You might be giving thanks a lot, but just for things He gives you. Is it holistic for who He is and for what He does? And is it also done verbally and publicly to glorify God and build up one another? Well, today we have seen that we are utterly dependent on God's goodness and that we should be driven to prayer in trials because God is powerful to save. He has the power to guide the lost soul free the captive soul, heal the sick soul, and calm the terrified soul. Amen? God is completely sovereign over everything. He can control creation, nations, wealth, health, social status, out of His goodness to either bless His obedient people or restore His disobedient people. And we have seen that we should give thanks for God's character and works in our hearts and publicly because God is glorified and we are protected from straying and others are encouraged as well. However, it would be a shame not to talk about the greatest display of God's goodness and steadfast love. We've talked about a few examples of where we often need God to save us, but the Bible teaches us that the thing we most need saving from is what? Sin. Sin and death. Our sin and disobedience, it deserves death because of His holiness. We couldn't save ourselves, and God sends His Son, Jesus Christ, to save us. He lived the perfect life that we couldn't live, willingly goes to the cross, and pays the price we couldn't pay. And three days later, He rose again to conquer death itself once and for all. You might be looking to 2024 with big plans, Maybe some resolutions as well. But at the moment, you might not be depending on God's goodness as much as you should be. Jesus Christ, He is our ultimate Savior. And we just came in communion to remember His death on the cross. And that is what we should be giving thanks for often. For those wandering spiritually lost, Jesus is the way and takes those who are far away from God and brings them near. For those chained in bondage of sin, Jesus is the liberator. For those with illnesses 
those fearing death, Jesus is the almighty healer and will restore our bodies with eternal life when he returns. And for those who are tossed about in the waves of uncertainty, Jesus calms every storm just as he did on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, he is the ultimate expression of God's goodness and love. And finally, in verse 43, what does it say there? Whoever is wise will observe these things, and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Whoever is wise will observe, take notice, meditate on these things. Before we rush into 2024, may we look back and reflect on our own lives and give thanks to God for His goodness. Let's become historians of His goodness. May we be persuaded that He's in control. He does everything the best way possible according to His goodness. And may we never tire of giving thanks for the freedom and salvation that our Savior Jesus Christ purchased for us. So just as the chorus said in like manner, oh, that we would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for the wonderful work of redemption through his son. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for what you've done, what you've done to redeem us. We thank you for the examples we see in Psalms 107, Lord all these different illustrations of how you saved, but Father, we know that our sin was the most, uh, the thing that held us most, Lord, held us in bondage, and you saved us, Lord, and we are thankful, and we are sorry, Lord, for not being nearly as thankful as we should be. Give us hearts of thankfulness. May we have our eyes attuned for your goodness, Lord. And Lord, if affliction comes, may we be able to endure it well, knowing you are in control, sovereign. And may we pray to you, Lord, when we face anything. We give thanks, Lord, and we sing to you now in praise. Amen.